we are attempting to do now uh, as we're very sensitive to, again, the needs of the people uh, here in our church and in our community. Uh, we're going to be shifting things up like we're trying to do this on a once a month basis that we take some time and to open up our Bible study to more of a, a forum space. We have an opportunity to talk in depth about issues that are faced that we are facing uh, in our society and in our community. Of course, you heard us with our young adults do it. Uh, you heard us do it with our generation, with our young people and our babies. Uh, they've done it. But on tonight, I'm excited that God has blessed us uh, with an amazing college of clergy and a CST team. That's our critical uh, strategy team. Some of our leaders who sit down and talk and think about brainstorm things that we could bring to you uh, that would be of great assistance to you. And one of the things one of, that we wanted to bring to you on tonight, uh, we are getting ready to start a journey here at UFC. We're going to be offering a program uh, that's going to be happening for for a number of weeks for not just our members, but for all of you who are out there in social media land and you want to be a part of that, uh, we are entering into a season where we are learning how to navigate loss and transition with grace. We're navigating loss, navigating transition with grace. How many of you know all of us experience loss? Uh, all of us have to deal with transition. And it's important that we learn how to do that in this season. We just come out of a storm. And you know how storms can trigger you. And when your atmosphere is disrupted, it can remind you of some things that you've lost. And many times we're affected by those things and we don't know how to deal with it. So on tonight, we have some members that are here. Everything we need is in the house at UFC. It's in the house. And we have some leaders that are in the house that I want you to hear from tonight that are going to share some great information with you, some insight, personal stories on how they deal and how they navigate loss and transition. So I'm going to ask now that members of our panel would come up and make their way to the stage. Come on, let's give them a hand as they come now. And they're going to introduce themselves to you. And we're going to have this panel discussion on tonight. And we're going to have a great time doing it in the house of the Lord. Now, listen, while you're doing this, and for those of you who are watching, who are on streaming as you're watching tonight, if you have questions, please, please, it's okay. Come on, El, come on. We ain't, we ain't that deep now. Come on now. Come on, come on. We're, so, listen, if you have questions, you can send those questions in via Facebook, uh, YouTube. Just send, write the questions down. Hit send. We want to answer your questions on tonight. So, I'm I'm excited to have our panel here. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being uh, here on tonight. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to start from my right, which is your left. Uh, Elder, if you could introduce yourself and tell us something about you briefly. I'm Elder Holland Pierre, and my assignment on this task was to speak briefly about uh, navigating the loss and transition through the funeral process. Okay. I am Sherry L. Jackson, a board certified clinical chaplain at the VA hospital. I specialize in hospice and palliative care as I help people to journey and to die in peace. Good evening, everyone. My name is Whitney Washington. I'm a certified nurse practitioner with over 14 years of service in healthcare. Um, specifically, I have currently working in hospital medicine in the Department of Hematology Oncology, as well as doing hospice care <laughs> on the side. Um, so that's my area that I've uh, experienced in and be able to partner with in the um, medical side of things, but also how that transitions into dealing with our chaplains that uh, help and associate us and specialize with us in this arena and area. Good evening. I'm, I'm the assistant pastor, Darren Boykins, Elder Darren Boykins. Um, I'm a former um, certified financial planner. Uh, I'm just a part of the CST team. Uh, we worked together and we came up with the concept of understanding the difficulty that people are having with grief. So we came up with this program, a six-week program, to let people know that you have the power to deal with grief. That's what we're going to deal with tonight. Good evening, I'm Kim Copeland, um, assistant pastor and one of the directors of clergy. And as my teammates have said, we just know how important it is to 
deal with grief in this time of season. We're getting ready for the holidays, and this is the time that sometimes people get depressed, and they're going into their shell and not sure that it is depression, not able to label what it is, and they go into this certain um, period of just sadness and anxiety and all of that. So we wanted to be able to touch on that head on and discuss it and give you ways to deal with it and cope with it because we are concerned as God is about the whole man in its totality. Amen, amen. My name is Elder Cheryl Spann and I serve as the secretary of the clergy strategic team. My assignment on this, uh, with this workshop is to tag team with Elder Harlan Pierre, um, and our speaker will be speaking on power of attorney, um, successions, as well as living wills and estate planning. Amen. Amen. Let's give it up for our, our panelists on tonight. All right, so listen, we're glad you guys are here, so we're going to start this discussion on tonight. So, of course, y'all know me. I'm going to throw my own twist on this thing, and, and we're going to have a good time doing it on tonight. But when we're talking about uh, navigating loss and transition with grace, another word for loss we, we talked about, you've heard it mentioned here, is grief. What, what is grief? Grief, by definition, grief is deep sorrow, especially caused by someone's death deep sorrow it is caused by someone's death or caused by loss something that all of us deal with we have all lost people we have all lost things that have caused us uh, to experience deep sorrow but on tonight we've said our goal is to help you navigate that so let's go. What does navigate mean? We're talking about navigating. Navigating is planning and directing the route or course of action of something with instruments or maps. So what we're trying to do is to give you some instruments that you can use to help you run this course, to help you deal with the grief or the loss that you are, are currently dealing with or will deal with at some time. So I want to talk about this um, because of our professionals that we have on the panel. When we talk about grief, I know you guys are familiar with five stages of grief, with denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance, all of these stages of grief that people have to deal with. So Elder Sherry, Dr. Sherry, can you tell me from your background and your experience, how do you deal with that? Because you said that you're literally having to help someone die peacefully. How do you as a professional deal with having to help somebody die? Well, first of all, I want to go back to your five stages of grief. There is no straight line. The five stages of grief Grief is ebbs and flows, highs and lows. It never leaves you. Um, you may start out in, uh, accept, you may be in acceptance, and you see something, you smell something, you hear something, will send you right back to stage one. So it is not a straight line. How I deal with grief is honestly, <laughs> I tell people in the beginning right now because I have not lost a, a parent or anything right there. Anything I say is theory right now. Amen. It, it's theory. Gotcha. Because I have not experienced it myself. I may not have experienced the death of a person, but I have experienced loss through divorce. I have experienced loss through transition, relocation. So how I deal with helping people to die is to understand that life is a cycle. And to say that um, I want to help people to die the way they want to die. Everybody will not die in peace. It is true if you struggled in life, depending on your lifestyle, 
sometimes your death will be a struggle because you are still trying to figure that thing out before you leave. Every day I have to make a conscious decision to have a support system to help me to get through that day. Today was a very harsh day. I had several deaths. Each one was different, and family members were different. So I'm not just there for the, um, the person that's dying, but also for the staff and for the um, family members. And every, every room has a different set of circumstances. So at the end of the day, I'm, I often call somebody and talk it out because tomorrow is going to present its own set of issues. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that, that's so important. And while we're jumping this topic, I'm going to go to Minister Washington, uh, especially in your field, in nurse practitioner. And I can only imagine what the things that you've seen, because I know as a pastor, I remember that there was a season where I was at a, a former ministry and I was just serving as an elder there. And at the time, right after, it's like right after that Katrina time coming back home, and there's a lot going on in the city. And I was being called to, you know, go to hospitals and pray. And I remember just a series of times within a few weeks, it's like, hey, 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 Elder Bhutan, can you come to the hospital? We need you to pray over this body. Young man just got killed. Can you come over here and pray for us, please? And it's like at a dime, I got to run to the hospital, and I'm sitting in an, an emergency ER room with a young man, 14 years old, body full of holes, just died, and they leave me in the room with the body and say, you can pray for him and do what you do. But you got, you got five minutes. And then you got to move on. And I remember the... My, the Sitting there, having to process and, and pray and then meet the family, they're screaming, you have to deal with this on a daily basis, every day. How in the world are you able to deal? Because we don't talk about this. And you, I mean, yeah, you're a minister here, but you're a minister when you're there. So how do you do this every day? Um. You know, I, I tell people all the time in transparency, if I had to choose the route, it would be, no, I'm not doing this. I have been um, physically graced for this walk every, and how do I do it, Pastor? because I've experienced it in my own life. The arena that I work in, um, and I can tell you that everything you go through in your life, God is going to find a way to make it count in the end. Um, nobody could have told me that I'm walking in a space where my mother was treated for cancer with the oncologist and the nurses and the staff that treated my mother. And so I walk, how I deal with it every day is I share my personal experience. And because people saw what God did through me, they're able to know that God is real. I tell people every time I see life and death in a day's time. I see the miracles of God in a day's time. I see what my doctors and other staff we're medical, right? But I always tell everybody where the medicine stops, God always continues. Mm. I tell my people, my patients that every day. That's good. And so my staff know, my doctors know that I'm rooted in Christ. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell y'all Jesus and whatever you do with it is yours. But honestly, how I get through it every day, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, I can't take credit for it because like I said, if I had the choice, the answer would be no. But I'm also able in the in arena where it's very hard, I'm able to see life and death in place. And I'm also to see that God is in full control. I'll give you an example just this week alone. And I was sharing with Dr. T before I got on the stage. It's been a tough week. I've had to be the social worker, the nurse practitioner, the minister in one week. I had a patient, literally, I was about to walk out the building that coded and died on me Monday evening. I'm about to walk out the door. Um, and then had to come turn around the next morning and talk to a patient that I had built a bond with um, to tell her that I have to send her to hospice. And then to come and deal with a domestic violence issue just yesterday. So. I literally take it and just in stride and I, I say, okay, God, you got to gotta give me what I need. But I also know the experience that I've had with God, that I can share God. That's how I get through it. Mm. Amen. So, again, navigating that, the one word, Jesus. Yeah. You need God in your life to help you navigate through the tough times. 
Uh, and I'm doing this because I want to bring everybody's experience. I want you to hear what people have to deal with. Don't get it twisted and think that just because you wear titles and we got degrees that we're not affected by loss. And so I'm going to take it a little bit further because I want you to hear these stories. Now, we've been talking about the fact of how you deal with grief on the job because of loss. Let's think about it from this perspective. What about when you're dealing with grief because someone is living yet dying? Elder Pierre, talk to me about that. So I can speak on that behalf because I, had, I saw it in two different perspectives. One being with my father. Uh, it started back in 2011 when my father took deadly sick. And the doctor said there was nothing they could do for him. But I went to the hospital, got there, and they told me he was just a matter of minutes before he died. Blood pressure 40, over 29 heartbeats per minute. Everything shut down, but the doctor said no. But I know a man named God said yes. And so watching him lay there, being fully alert, knowing he's about to transition because they called the priest to give him his last rites, the whole nine yards. And so knowing that he's going to transition, but not knowing that he wasn't going to transition. So he was living but yet dying, right? if that makes sense. And so when I went to pray, God said to me, his sickness is not unto death. That was 2011. This is 2024, my father's still living. As a matter of fact, he just had a birthday yesterday. He's 89 years old. But let's flip that script now. I had a mother that I didn't know was sick, right? And we took her to the doctor to get a stent put in her heart. And she told us, to our face, today I get a good rest. But we didn't understand that, what she was saying to us. The minute they put her on the table, she crashed and died. But they resuscitated her and brought her back. My mother lived six and a half months after that, right? But I watch her transition and day by day. Keefe was my witness. I watch her transition day by day where she was losing everything. Losing, losing her, her bowels and losing her bladder and her taste, the whole nine yards. I watched this. And it wasn't easy to sit there and watch your mother die in front of you. My mother died sitting beside me in, the, in my car as I was trying to get to the hospital. She transitioned on me while I was driving. But how I dealt with it was I felt I had to be strong for my family. So the grief has always been with me. And I, I told her to pastor, I said, I never had the chance to grieve my mother's death because I have to be strong for my children, be strong for my dad, be strong for my siblings and everybody around me. Because God, the God I serve, he keeps me with grace. And that's how I deal with my grief. Amen. Amen. Thank you for sharing that. And that's because he says something. I want y'all to hear that. He said, I never got an opportunity to grieve my mother's debt because I'm being strong for everybody else. And how many times you know being strong for everybody else can kill you? May I add something, Pastor? Yes. There's a real danger in not grieving because it will catch up with you. When we don't deal with, when we have losses on top of losses and we keep burying the grief, it just stacks up and stacks up until one day it explodes. And perhaps you don't know why you're so mean. Or perhaps you don't know why you're eating, drinking, drugging, or whatever it is that, or sexing, whatever it is that you are doing because you are trying to deal with this thing that you have never, uh, you're trying to not deal with it, but the body keeps the score. It mm. stays in your body and it will eventually come out. And so it is best to deal with the grief before grief deals with you. Amen. 
get, giving information, I'm bringing this to the forefront because so many of us deal with this. And I know all of you sitting there and even those of you watching online have similar stories. You're starting to be able to identify. And I want to want these things to come out because some of us never dealt with it. So we're tapping into some things to bring it out so we can show you how to navigate this space. I'm coming to this side of the room again because we have some powerful testimonies uh, that are here that you need to hear because you see these people every day and you never know. Some of them have some amazing stories. And I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Kim. Many of you don't know her testimony. But you've had to deal with grief in a major way. How did God keep you through it? How are you still standing? It's really God. You know, on my Christian journey, I have peaks and valleys. And I thank God to this day that when my husband was murdered by an 18-year-old boy named Alan Greer, that I was at a high point with him. And he kept me. Um, I even got to the point that I knew I needed to forgive Alan. But at that time, I wasn't ready to forgive him. And I went on a retreat, and I tried everything not to go on this retreat. And I can't remember the facilitator's name. I just remember an exercise. And at that point, I was truly able to forgive him. But not only forgive him, but pray and ask that God would save him. Because I didn't want what he did to my family that he do to another family. I have two kids by marriage. And they were 8 and 13. And I had a three-month-old baby who never got a chance to know her father. And so it was nothing but by the grace of God that I was able to stand then and I stand now. And to be perfectly honest, grief is different at different times, as we've said before. Um, now, I did ask God. Please don't let me cry or break down at the service because I knew if I did, everybody else would. And I wanted to be strong for everybody else. And he kept me with that. But it's like you just know that he's there with you and he's going to take care of you. And you walk through it um, daily. And like I said, sometimes one year, to be totally transparent, this year I was going to Baton Rouge and it was, I got married in Baton Rouge. It was at one o'clock. That was the time of my wedding. I'm in the car with my coworker. And honestly, I can tell you, that was the first time that I shed tears. And she was like, what's going on? I was like, nothing. And then I finally told her what happened. And I think it's because I'm going to Baton Rouge. This was the time of my wedding. So it put me in that space and that memory that this is what's going on with me. And like I said, too, you know, different years bring about different things. And grief looks different. And you have to deal with it your way. Can't nobody tell you how to deal with grief. You have to do what makes you comfortable, make you comfortable in what you have peace at. And some persons or uh, people might have to be on the go and just busy. That's okay. Somebody may just need to be home alone and just give me my space. And Rizba was one in the Bible when her two kids were hanging out. Her grief brought her into action. She was out there making sure the birds um, and the wild animals wasn't take, you know, eating her boy's flesh. So it just depends on you. And it's okay for how you grieve. So don't let anyone tell you you have to grieve a certain way or a certain length of time. It's, it's a personal thing. And one other thing about grief is I was six months pregnant. And I lost my baby boy, so I have a daughter. And I tell her, you're my firstborn, but you're not my first child. I mm. lost my son. And sometimes people think because you didn't hold him that he's not there. But I carried him. So he is important. So there would be some times when I would think about him and get sad. And it was like, but he wasn't even born. But I carried him. So that's still my child. So grief can be even in that sense. So grief it's in so many different ways, but again, it was just nothing but the grace of God. Amen. Thank you for being willing to share uh, those testimonies. Pastor Boykins, I want to shift it to you. You talked about the area of financial planning, and I know you have some experience with this with your family and owning a funeral home back where you, a family is from, but can you tell us from your experience 
the grief that can come upon people because they have not planned for that moment. Yes, that's very important. Um, one of the things that, especially in the African-American community, we like to live moment to moment, but we chase pleasure. We're chasing things like jewelry, a bigger house, a bigger car, clothing, we're gonna party. And like for example, some people when they had this little maze event, everybody went and bought white outfits, brand new white outfits to walk down the street, down the uh, street and have a good time. But if you ask those people, do they have life insurance or burial policies, they'll say no. It's not important, but there's one, Ecclesiastes says that there's a time and season for everything. And there's an appointed time for everybody to die. And you don't get notice. Mm -hmm. It's just happened. And so, but when it happens and you have not planned for it, it brings a, an additional level of grief that most people have to deal with. So it's important that you take time to plan. Everybody needs to sit down with, 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 with an insurance company or with a funeral home and pre-plan everybody's funeral. And you have to put money aside for it. You can't just be blowing and going. Because when the crisis hit, you're gonna have to sell everything you have. You know, that, look, I ask everybody this question. Who can you pick up the phone with right now and call and ask them for $10,000? Who can you pick up and call right now and ask for $20,000? If you can't, that means you've got to start saving some money. You have to stack where you want to go. The most important thing is planning for the security of your family. And even when that happens, if you plan, I find that most people get over-emotional. The funeral, you might have planned a funeral, be beautiful, casket, everything, and it was $5,000. As soon as that person died, you go spend another fifteen, twenty thousand. dollars $20,000. No, you got emotional. They're going to exploit you. You know, that's why you have to be rooted and grounded. And if you have a plan and you work your plan, they're not going to be able to exploit you, right? So you have to make sure that you take care of your family. You want to have a burial policy. You want to have life insurance so you can deal with this new expense. It's going to be a lot of expenses. Electricity is going to be higher. The water is going to be higher. Uh, you, you're going to start falling behind on your bills because it's an unexpected expense. And so you have to plan it. It's important that you, whenever you, you, you get paid, set aside, like the tides, set aside 10% for, for emergencies because there are going to be emergencies. Who knew we was going to have a hurricane? And the city would be shut down for four days. It could have been a couple of weeks. Look, you don't want to find yourself in the food line, in the pantry line. It's okay. But even the line alone, you can pass it up because you plan for it. So that's all I'm saying. I got you. Plan is important. And thank you, Pastor Boykins, for that. But I, I, he said something that was very key, that death brings about different types of emotions. We emotionally do things. And having to, we have to be able to navigate those emotions when we experience loss. He said people go into debt, spending money they don't have because they're emotional. And I'm not, we're not knocking all of the things. I get it. But think about, think about the amount of money that we spend in funerals for one to two hours. Let that sink in. The funeral service is an hour. Then you go to the gravesite. That's less than 15 minutes. You go to the repast, eat your food, get your paper plates and your tinfoil and your plastic bag and go home. Now you face with the reality that you didn't spend all that you had. And guess what? <laughs> Everybody else is gone. Yeah. You have to learn how to manage your emotions. And while we're saying we're bringing these things out because we introduced this six-week course for you, we're going to go into more depth and detail on because there's no way we can give you all the strategies and tools in a 40-minute Bible study. But we're opening you up so you can know what's coming because we're going to be giving you these tools, and we want you in this program uh, to help you navigate this process. Uh, Elder Spain, I want to jump to you. 
from the perspective of dealing with grief, and we all know and love your husband, Pastor Spain, and Miles Spain is a great, great man, but you had to deal with grief while yet assuming his role as pastor in ministry. How are you able to still function as a leader in ministry while yet dealing with that type of loss? Well, Pastor, I can tell you it was nobody but God. I, for a while, I just, I, I was like overwhelmed. My mind was all over the place. I, it was the hardest thing for me to accept him not being here anymore because we had planned to grow old together. And that's what I looked forward to. And he passed on a Tuesday and the prayer line is on Wednesday. And most people probably thought we wouldn't be having a prayer line. I knew that I was not emotionally able to take care of the prayer line that morning, but I was able to call one of our dear friends, uh, evangelist Melanie Pichon, and um, she you know, did the prayer line on that Wednesday. And I just began to pray and ask God, what is the lesson in this that you're trying to teach me? And I've always had compassion for seniors and children. I love them dearly. And when my husband passed away, I remembered something that he had told me when my mother passed away. My mother passed away 10 years ago. And when I had gone to see her in February, I was in New Orleans. She was in a nursing home in New Iberia. I went to see my mom and I knew at that point Mama was transitioning. So I came back home and the Holy Spirit told me, you need to start working on your mom's obituary. So I, I started working on that and then one of my sisters told me, she said, well golly, mama's not even dead yet and you done put her in the grave. And I said, no, that's not exactly what I'm doing. I said, God is allowing me to do this now while I can because when the time comes, I'm going to be so fulfilled with grief, I won't be able to. And what do you think happened when my mom passed away? There was no way I would be able to do that. So I said all of that to say, in, in ministry with my husband, I was his help me, and I didn't really do a lot in ministry as I'm doing right now. However, I have learned so much from watching him, and there's one saying that he had, and I share Pastor Kim and I share this all the time, and he's, he's talked about when you're going through something, how to handle the crisis. And I think grief is the ideal time to say that. Improvise, adapt, and overcome. Amen. Improvise, adapt, and overcome. I like that. Uh, thank, thank you again for sharing. And of course, many of you who are watching online are sending in comments that they love the openness and the transparency. And thank you all for sharing uh, your experiences with us. Uh, but I want to take it further. I know we say, I've heard everybody say God. I've heard everybody say Jesus. And that's great. But I haven't heard anybody say therapy. I, I, I'm coming to that plate because I haven't heard. I, I, hey, I want I want to talk about that because I, I get it. We say, gee, and I and I I know God is able. He's a keeper, but sometimes it's okay to get a therapist. It's okay to have somebody help you to talk about it. I'll give you a personal example. Then I let our professionals talk about how important that journey is. I lost my father a while back in 2007. Right, my father was 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 has passed away, and I can I be honest with y'all? It happened in 2007. I preached my dad's sermon, his funeral. I eulogized my dad, went to the grave site, deposited the body. I ain't been back since. I have not put a headstone since 2007. 2024 have not been back did not do it everybody saying why are you able 
I'm in therapy. I tell you that all the time. And I go to therapy, and we start talking about that with my therapist. And I'm like, I, you know, I said, put a heads on my dad's thing, you know. And she's like, so why haven't you done it? I don't know. Mr. Bhutan, why haven't you done it? I don't know. That's not a sufficient answer, Mr. Bhutan. Why? You should have done that. Why? You, will you stop asking me about doing that? And she keeps pressing. So you got to, I, I'm not ready to let him go yet. In that 2007 to 2020, I'm not ready to let him go. She said, you need to write a, a letter to your dad, a goodbye letter. I'm saying, so that means that I've been grieving this since 2007. But I would not have known that until I talked to somebody. So can we speak to the importance to our professionals? Can y'all speak to the importance of therapy in helping you to navigate your grief and loss? Yes. Um, I just got one, a therapist. Helpers, as we are, are the worst people <laughs> when it comes to getting help. Right? Because we're so busy helping, and we use it as a crutch not to deal with our own stuff. All of us are what we call wounded healers. Mm. We have our own wounds that we are trying to deal with as we help bind up the wounds of others. But ours are often left undone. So just in December, I had a friend tell me, you know, you're really powerful, but I'm looking for the day when you can minister out of your wholeness and not your hurt. Mm. So what you talking about? <laughs> she said, I'm looking for the day that you can minister out of your wholeness and not your hurt. <laughs> so I got a therapist. I got a therapist. Um, church folk and Christians are the hardest people to get a therapist. Now, I know that we say, you know, Jesus is my everything. You know, Jesus is my everything. My husband, Jesus ain't my husband now. Jesus, my husband, you know, my friend, my mother, my father, all of these things. And so we use it as a crutch, really. But I think, Pastor, by you, it has to start at the pulpit. Because us is specifically in the black church. Unless it comes from the pulpit, we just don't think it's true. So you have freed many people tonight to say it's Jesus and therapy. That Jesus, even the word heal, it has its roots in the what word that comes from therapy. So when Jesus was healing, he was instituting a form of therapy. And Jesus didn't heal the same way all the time. Sometimes he sped on the ground. You know, sometimes he touched, sometimes he spoke. So it's many different ways that we can engage in therapy. And so um, let's not, there's many things that we can do. Yes, we can talk to our pastors, but can I be honest that a lot of our pastors and spiritual leaders are not trained to deal with Real, the real life is, yes, they can pray for us, and yes, they can do, you know, the things and tell us what, what God says, and all of that is, is but they are mind, we are mind, body, and spirit. As chaplain, I'm a doctor of the soul. A psychologist is a doctor of the mind, right? And then there is the medical doctor. We really need to have all three in our lives. Mm -hmm. Chime in, Nehemiah. 
Um, so to kind of piggyback on that, I, I, uh, I'm a proponent for therapy as well. Um, but my therapist came after my divorce. Mm. So there's a level of grief that comes from losing. And I tell people uh, one time that I kind of learned after losing my mom and my grandmother two months apart and then having my divorce some years prior to that. I told them divorce was harder. And I'm going to tell you why. Because it wasn't final. I could walk up on my ex-husband any minute. <laughs> so it's like, all right. So I had to learn to go to therapy on how to deal with interacting with him. And to be honest, I knew I was in a healed place when I could speak to him and say, hello, and how are you? And I'm well, and that is it, right? And so what therapy, I think, charges us to do is to learn how to process thought and how to interact when those things occur as they will. Because as uh, um, Dr. Uh, Jackson mentioned, it's ebbs and flows. So what therapy is gonna help you learn how to do is how to navigate with grace, the ebb and the flow. Um, to be to also piggyback on that as somebody who is a um, healthcare provider, we take care of everything in this body except our mind. Mm -hmm. The weirdest thing that I hear often is, I'm not crazy. Mm -hmm. And I used to tell people, who said you were? <laughs> you know, I, I never, I didn't say that. I, so we go to the, the heart doctor for our hearts. We go to the lung doctor for our lungs. We go to the kidney doctors for our kidneys. Yet we say, I don't need to go to a doctor for my mind. Guess what? It's an organ. It functions, and as a matter of fact, it's the organ that controls every other organ, so why not treat it? I'll give you another caveat. As a healthcare provider, I can't even treat your other illnesses until I treat your mental illness. Mm. Because it's going in one ear and coming straight out the other. And so I need you all to be able to trust that the person that you're, that, and let God lead you. Listen, and going to a therapist is just like firing a doctor. I don't like you, I'm going to another one. It is fine. It has been the best decision, and I, for a total years, I've been in therapy for nine years, and I go off and on. Mm -hmm. When I need to check in, I'm like, guess what I call? I'll be like, Dr. Coleman, Dr. Wellington Coleman. <laughs> I say, hey, uh, I need to check in, buddy. And he say, all right, let's put you on the schedule. And I don't mind. To the, um, to the point of like when I, my mom died. So my mom died April 1st of 2019, and on June 4th, 2019, I lost the, my grandmother. Those are the two women who raised me. So imagine being in a cloud in the middle of NP school and, t and saying, okay, I got to finish the semester, but I have to bury two women. And I never buried nobody in my entire life. I was like, where do I start? <laughs> got through it. I did not really process my grief for that best. As you said, mine was delayed. I, my, my mental started shutting down right after the pandemic because the pandemic came right after and I was in the middle of school and working full time to support myself. So imagine having to see people die from the pandemic and then I still haven't even processed my mother and my grandmother. Y'all, my mind, I shut completely down. I have to tell you, I could not have done that if I did not go sit on somebody's couch and say, okay, and be transparent. I don't like it here. I'm going to be honest. Another thing we don't do is we're not transparent with God either. We don't tell God how we really feel. Sometimes that's what he needs. So in addition to the therapy piece and being honest with your therapist, don't lie, y'all, because we can't help you. As medical professionals, tell the truth. I can't even tell you how many times people have come into my office and I'm like, okay, what's going wrong with you? We're hurt. Oh, nothing. <laughs> well, you're here. <laughs> So Sick people don't time. come to the hospital. I mean, well, people don't just come to no, the hospital. No, well, people oh, don't. Fine. No, what fine. You doing here? And I'm like, no, <laughs> but can you be honest? So all of that to say, no, I am a huge proponent for therapy because I have done therapy for nine years, and it is, it is another component of how I get through even for my job. Even when my job becomes overwhelming, I check in with my therapist. Thank you for sharing that again. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. T, because that's what might help me to want to push me. You go, you need to go to therapy. You need to, you need to get some help in some areas. She pushed me to do it. No, not, not like, but she pushed me. No, seriously, no, for real. I'm laughing and joking, but that's what it helped me does. She yeah, sees a problem absolutely. and says, hey, I'm going to push you until you get the help for that problem. Can I chime in, Pastor? Yes, sir. So I was sitting here listening, and I wasn't going to say anything. The Holy Spirit said, speak it out. I never thought I would believe in a therapist for any reason whatsoever. But after going through a divorce, after not dealing with grief, after just letting it all ball up and inside, I said it was time. 
So I finally got a therapist, and it's been helping in more ways than one because I'm able to release some things and not always feel like it's all balled up inside of me. Not, and I guess the hardest part is, and I told my therapist this, the loneliness that you feel when you're grieving is the hardest thing to deal with. And that's where I was. I had been sunk to the bottom of the barrel of feeling lonely. And I felt I needed to talk to somebody. And, and I, I heard pastor say one day, because I was in there talking to him, and he said, you know, I, I, I go to my therapist, and I said, maybe I need to try this and see how it helps me. And so I go to the therapist, and I'm able to release a whole lot of things. And it's a weight that comes off you that you can't even imagine. You know, uh, and as she said, you have to be transparent. Put it all out there on the table and just let it go. Thank you so much. And I, you guys can see this is this is this is what I wanted that conversation. I wanted you to hear these things again because what you're hearing is that people come to church and they got some serious issues. People are sitting in here holding on to all kind of stuff, holding on to grief that's sitting right next to you, and you wouldn't even know it. All of that's happening in ministry. So don't think it's strange. Don't think so. Guess what? Sometimes people be looking at you. They ain't, got, they ain't mad at you. They just got a lot going on in their mind. If somebody walking and don't speak to you on a Sunday, it ain't because they don't like you. Baby, they just dealing with a lot of stuff right now. I want you to understand that everybody has things that are going on uh, in here. We're all trying to navigate this thing called life and make this thing work. So I wanted to bring up that therapy portion, and I appreciate you guys for, for talking about your experiences and talking about your journey. Again, as we go into this process, this six-week course, we're going to lean more into that if you're a part of that to tell you about how you can get that type of help with therapy, how you can take care of that financial piece, how you you can navigate the funeral process. That's why we have these people that are up here. We're willing to help you walk and navigate that piece. I, I know we got to close this thing out, so I want to come back to this side of the room, uh, and we'll close out with you three. Ken, in closing remarks, uh, can you guys briefly share and encourage the congregation? Tell me what are scriptures or stories that you use biblically that have helped you to navigate your grieving process on the, in, on the word. I, I look at Ecclesiastics. There's a time and season for everything, but I want to put a different spin on the therapist. I have a philosophy that if you hear something, do something. A lot of times that we see our, our friends and our family members, they're suffering, and if we hear they're suffering, we have to get involved in their life. We're their foundation, so we have to begin to spend time with them. And know that when you're dealing with the issue of grief, we learned that it starts from birth to death. And so you know that your journey in helping them is going to be long term. A lot of people don't want to get involved because once you get involved, it's a long term process. And that means it, it involves your resources. You have to help them financially, help them mentally. And you have to be there for them late in the midnight hours. They have to be able to feel comfortable to be able to call you. So remember that, that God wants us to navigate this journey with grace. We have to be the grace. We have to be the Christ. We have to be the, the, the light and the salt for our family members, our neighbors, and our friends. We have to help people come out, unanchor them. Mine would be Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me because life is life in and its journey at yeah, different places at different times. And I know that through him, I can do it. And just one other thing, I was one of those who felt like you don't need therapy, but I have changed my mind, and not just today, but from a while ago, and I think I might find me a therapist. Amen. I said, this is not just for them. I said, this is for us to be ministered to as well. Amen. 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 My God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. In 2012, I lost my mother on April the 24th. I lost my dad two weeks prior to that. I lost my uncle a week after, and then my first sister that passed away was in August. That was all in one year. And then here comes 2021, and it's almost a repeat of the same thing. 
I lose my husband on February 22nd. His funeral was on March the 4th. My sister died on March the 5th. Then I had two sisters that passed away. I had two aunties that passed away. My niece passed away in November of the same year. And then my brother passed away in December. And then you look at me and people say, how in the world can you do that? How, how, how do you do that? I give it to God and then I just trust that he's going to give me everything that I need. And then this church, we are so close knitted together. I cannot begin to tell you how my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ called me. They prayed for me. There were times when I didn't want to talk to anybody. I would just let the phone go to voicemail. When I listened to voicemail, one prayer after the other. And those things are uplifting. So we're here for one another, and we all go through the same thing together. But one thing we should remember is that God knows what we need, when we need it, and he's always on time. Amen. Amen. Listen, don't be reminded, people of God, that, listen, Psalms 34 and 18 reminds us that the Lord draws nigh to those that yes. are brokenhearted. He's near. When you feel broken, when you feel crushed in your spirit, in your mind, guess what? God is right there. He sees you right where you are. Matthew 5 and 14 said, blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. First Peter 5 and 7, I can cast all my cares on him because he truly cares for me. Psalm 73 and 26, my flesh and my heart may fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. God is our all in all and so on tonight. I hope we were able to help you uh, just to start this process of navigating loss and transition with grace. Again, stay tuned. Uh, we have some exciting classes that are coming up that we want to be sharing with you. The topics we'll discuss uh, beginning, I want to say we'll talk what is grief loss, the different types of grief, how to deal with grief. That'll be October the 2nd and 9th, the dying process and palliative care hospice, October the 16th, October 23rd and 30th, estate planning. Uh, these are sessions that will be made available to you via Zoom. And so we're having this going on. It's free. Uh, open to everybody because we care about you and we want to help you navigate this. So we'll be sending out this information very soon, but we just wanted to let you know that this church cares about the total man, uh, mind, body, and spirit, and we're going to be here for you. So can we give it up for all of our panelists on tonight? Thank you all so much. Thank you, social media, for being with us on tonight. Listen, we can sit right here and do this a little